And today's music is God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, the instrumental version from the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, makers of many fine holiday musics. Hello and welcome to DDO Cast, episode 264, recorded not so live, after the end of the world, but before the end of Festival. I'm your host, Secret Trent, with me is lovely producer, wife, and Trent. Hello everybody! Uh, Merry Christmas and happy Festival. Indeed, a happy Festival to us all. Catch live shows. Sunday afternoons on G+, Hangouts, or on DDOcast at www.ddocast.com slash live, where you can watch the recorded shows like this on YouTube, or listen to it on iTunes, or on our RSS feed at ddocast.com. Uh, get all the showtimes, updates, and DDO goodness on Facebook, Twitter, and G+, as DDOcast, and of course, on ddocast.com. On the podcast this week, we run down the week's news, we listen to some holiday poetry, we learn the meaning of festival, we wander the world of dragon fragments and get a little epic education with Shamgar, and we do a bit of commerce with the coin lords. So uh, grab your festival to stout twig and some strong dwarven ale and let the good times roll. Let's start by learning about festival, or it is, it is more commonly known in Eberron, the Festival of Long Shadows. When the Sovereign Lord Arion created the first arcane spells, he also brought a source of darkness into the world, a sentient force of pure magic that stole Lore Orion's own shadow to serve as its vessel. According to myth, the shadow became a god of the Dark Six, lurking in the shadowy places of the world, spreading dread and despair, spawning foul monsters, and granting power to those who use magic for corruption or evil purposes. Regardless of the truth of these tales, there are three days in Volt in which Eberron observes the Night of Long Shadows. These days correspond to our Earth date of December 26, 27, and 28, where dark magic dominates. For most common folk, it is a time to stay indoors and huddle around a fire. But for the minions of darkness, it is a time to rise and leave the shadows to prey upon the weak and foolish who ignore the legends. The primary worshippers of the dark deity are the monsters of Droam, the ones invading Stormreach in Update 8. Human followers of the Shadow are usually wizards and sorcerers. During these three nights of long shadows, it is said that a mage could gather enough power to complete a particularly difficult arcane experiment, experiments such as the construction of an eldritch machine. So the coin lords have determined that the terror of long shadows must end. To this end, they devised the festival as a celebration festival as a celebration to drive evil out of the city. Instead of cowering from the shadows, citizens are encouraged to exchange gifts with their adventuring partners and loved ones, and by slaying the monsters who threaten the city's well-being, they may collect festival coins to demonstrate their dauntless spirit in the face of long shadows and the dark six. The jester of festival signifies the start of festival celebrations. The jester is disguised as <clears throat> a friend of the coin lords. Nobody knows his true name, but they can easily be identified by his colorful garb and dwarven stature. Ah, indeed, and that is the true meaning of Festival. Also, the true meaning of Festival is watching my wife's halfling character get beat up by scorpions, <laughs> which means I cannot see the show notes or read them. Well, not right now, but let's talk about when we wrote that piece. I think it was last year? Uh, might be. Uh, I, uh, did you write it? I think you wrote it. Yeah, I wrote it last year. Um, it's been a while, but I, I thought it was pretty cool that they finally gave some lore and background about what the festival is and how it was created. And, and here is a Sig's character, the Fest Festervolt Jester. Yes. Want to talk about your Festervolt? Uh, right. Well, I wanted to make a character that looked like the Festival Jester because I noticed that you could do that, and so he has pretty much the exact same face. It's actually kind of hard sometimes to zoom in and get a good read on the face, but um, that's what he looks like. Uh, they don't have clothes that look exactly the same, but I found the most festive ones I could. And yeah, I changed the name. You can't actually call your character Festivolt, or somebody already has. Um, and so I chose Festervolt because I had planned to be a uh, zombie uh, monk. So he's a level 7 uh, wizard and level 3 monk at the moment. He's actually a way better character than you might think. He, he kicks a lot of butt. He's very hard to kill. And that's the true meaning of Festival. Yeah, his, his bio says a little thing about uh, he will not hand out cookies <laughs> like his uh, brother. He um, doesn't do any baking. Oh, that's so sad. I guess he deals in raw meat. Yeah, yeah he just punches people in the face. That's pretty much how it works. <laughs> and uh, stinks a lot. Yeah, so. Anyways, back to the game news. Yeah, I mean, would you want a zombie making your cookies? Right, game news, sure. No, no, no. Uh, let's see, Bug Tracker this week. Um, uh, you know... 
Before I get into the, the bug of the week, uh, I have to say the game has been surprisingly not very buggy as of late, which is great. Uh, they actually seem to have battened down the hatches and uh, killed most of the creepy crawlers that were giving people a hard time. So um, I'm glad to see things in a nice stable state, and hopefully they can stay that way through the next patch. That would be awesome. Um, but anyway, there are still plenty of bugs in the game. Uh, one of the ones that we saw something about on the forums, uh, if you're hack... Half-Orc happens to be sad because his medium epic green dragon scale armor is invisible. Well, there is hope. Um, uh, Take Heart for Feather of the Sun claims that we're on schedule to have that bug fixed sometime in Update 17. Somebody posted a poor picture of the orc uh, in his shame and his skivvies because you really can't see anything when you're wearing the medium uh, epic green dragon scale. So, uh, Which is too bad because this stuff is a pain in the butt to make. you got to collect all the, the, the uh, scales, which takes a while, and then you've got to get your favor for the purple dragon knights, which pretty much re means running almost everything on epic elite. Uh, that's available for Purple Dragon Knight favor, and then you gotta collect 15 combinations from the Druids and 15 combinations from the Purple Dragon Knights, and then you gotta run the raid like three times to get the three commendations. It's a lot of work, uh, and still working on it. Yeah, well, I'm working on the Purple Dragon Knight favor, which is having to do a lot of Epic Elite, which is very difficult to do on a pug and on duo, so I have to beg friends and give them my loot in order to complete those quests at that level range. So, anyways, uh, I was thinking um, update 17, that's going to happen usually around DDO's annual birthday, which is February. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well, End of February is when DDO first came out, and that would be like, oh my god, seven years? Yeah. I think. And I guess I it look might, that up. <laughs> <laughs> might come out a little before that. We'll see. They've been working on that Epic Giant Hold stuff for a long time, and I think that is the, the main focus of update 17 uh, from oh that's a right when um tolero held her uh, little um holiday charity drive mm -hmm. some of us got to to choose which which items get to have an epic level uh -huh. so that's right we get to see that yeah i think it should be really interesting we'll see some really challenging stuff kind of upper level things i'll have to say epic elite uh you know Anna and i by ourselves have a hard time we have some pretty good characters not you know major super super <laughs> we're, badasses we're not but they're power pretty good players <laughs> eh, but, you know, but we don't suck, but still Epic Elite was a bit challenging. We, we did one of the quests. We could probably eke out a couple more, but it's a real struggle. Yeah, I would struggle. need more hirelings and more mnemonic potions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, I don't like to use too many potions. It doesn't doesn't quite feel natural to me, so. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, quite the challenge. But with our guildies, it should not be a problem. Uh, they are badasses, and uh, combining forces, you are stronger than you are alone. Okay. Uh, what else we got in game? Uh, there's not a lot of game news. Uh, we've got bonus days, currently 15% heroic XP boost until January 2nd. That is always lovely. Uh, DDO store news, Quarter Master X assures us that free items will be returning in 2013. Usually we like to give out the codes on the show. Haven't had one of those in a few weeks, uh, but they will be back. Yay! Double bonus points till January 3rd, always good if you want to buy points. Uh, double bonus days are usually the best ones. Occasionally they have something even slightly better, but, uh... These are pretty awesome. They also have like the 200, you get like 60,000 points or something crazy or 3,000. Hey, they're in the holiday giving spirit, aren't they? <laughs> I guess so. I mean, you'll be giving them uh, the holiday spirit 200, 200 clams, so they'll be yeah. giving you some digital goods, but well, we like those digital well, goods. So. Not to mention that holiday bonus box, the Otto's Irresistible holiday bonus box with that Boku... <laughs> yeah, and on the forum, somebody um, you know was saying, "Yeah, a friend of mine bought like thirty boxes." And I'm like, seriously, that's a lot of cash. Um, but I guess a fair number of people went for that, did so. It's pretty popular. Wow, fifty bucks a shot—that's like thirty times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm talking about a lot of money. <laughs> um, but you know, like I said, there are some people out there that uh, you know they like playing. They got a lot of cash, so they're happy to spend it. I'm happy they spend it. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things that gives turbine money. I guess that's going to someone's paycheck. Yep. So. I don't care. You know, <laughs> characters all you like. Not my problem. And, and if I, I don't know, if I were inclined to spend more, it's the sort of thing I'd buy because I, I love leveling characters. You know what I would really love to see is um, a true holiday package with a true sense of. Christmas spirit and giving, and that's you can buy an in game virtual item, and then a certain percentage of that goes to a charity. I don't care what kind of charity, whether it be UNICEF or you know, Children's Hospital or something, but I would like to see more of that. Yeah, that'd be cool if they did that once in a while. Yeah. I think that'd be great. Let's see. Also, we got 50% off of Menace of the Underdark. If you're waiting to buy that, you should buy it. It's very good. Uh, if you're ever inclined to do it, do it when it's 50% off. 
Good to go. 20% uh, off of all Eberron Adventure Packs and Quest XP Elixirs. Always fairly popular. I get enough free ones now. I don't buy them very often, but um, every once in a while. But I don't, I'm not one of those people that has to keep them running at all times. I just, you know. Then I just want to have them, not when I don't. I would keep it running on my TR. Uh, and that's that's like all the news. So uh, Yeah, for this week, because we're kind of busy and they're kind of busy. It and it's the holidays. It's not a whole lot going on. It's holidays. <laughs> it's okay. a holiday. But hey, this show is jam-packed with little audio clips. So what have we got next? A word from our sponsors for this evening. The Festival of the Twelfth Moon will soon be coming to an end. Now, thanks to a special mint from the Coin Lords Bank, you can treasure your Festivalt memories for generations to come. The Coin Lords have commissioned a special run of high-quality gold coins, embossed with your favorite memories of the holiday. Each coin features an intricately detailed front and back. On the front is an incredible likeness of the Jester of the Festival. On the back are one of no less than ten gifts from the holiday. The Warforged Titan Cookie, the Cupcake, the Abbot, the Twig, the Lump of Coal. Each set comes in a special display case suitable for mounting in your home. These limited edition collector's items will not be around long, so order yours today. The Festivalt Memories Collection from the Coin Lords Bank. Yours for only 10,000 platinum. And if you order now, the set will come with a certificate of authenticity signed by the jester himself. Order the Festival of the Twelfth Moon Collector's Coin Set. And remember the memories forever. Uh, thank you, Festival Join the uh, Collector's Set thing. We appreciate <laughs> your patronage. <laughs> yeah, that's Jerry. That uh, is Jerry. You made that such a long time ago, and we still love it, so... Yeah, well, yeah, he has a background in radio, so he's he's perfectly awesome at mimicking those sort of local radio commercials or cheesy radio <laughs> commercials. He's got the perfect voice. He knows, like, exactly how they're assembled, what kind of bits and pieces they have. So, yeah, pretty awesome. <clears throat> oh, and they pay big bucks, of course, you know, which is oh, great. Well, yeah. Yeah. Anything, Every time we play that, it's Anything like, that know, pays Jerry. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see. Uh, so next up, uh, we're going to have a segment. Uh, we've got PJS Techie, a.k.a. Shamgar, who is going to give us epic education, Lord of Blades, Part 3. Hello, and welcome to Epic Education, a show of tips and tactics for surviving epic content. I'm your guide Shamgar, and this is episode 25, The Lord of Blades Part 3, The Forge Boss. Of all the roles during the Lord of Blades boss fight, the tank is the most crucial. Unlike most other existing bosses, tanking the Lord of Blades demands attention, quick reaction, and practice. A typical party will bring one solid tank, and perhaps a second tank, but if your tank and backup tank go down, it is likely that chaos will ensue. The Lord of Blades hits hard, and even if a non-tank is able to survive, it will likely be at the expense of more resources. A high-end epic caliber tank will be able to intimidate the Lord of Blades, which requires a skill of around 80 on epics, have a good amount of damage mitigation, be beefy with the hit points, and will have high healing amp. Healing amp and damage mitigation are important for survivability. The Lord of Blades hits hearts, especially when you get up to epic elite. Damage mitigation will help keep you alive by reducing some of this damage. Casters can also cast Cloud Kill on Lord of Blades to give concealment, but this can be risky because of how often his aggro list flushes. Healing Amp allows your healers to use scrolls, healing auras, and spell-like abilities more often, which will help save spell points in the SP pots. The Lord of Blades has a special ability that acts as a debuff and can stack, called Touch of Mornlands. This debuff reduces your maximum hit points and imposes a spell fail chance. Blocking does prevent this from landing, so a tank should expect to spend some time blocking on higher difficulties. This is the reason for Intimidate. By using this skill, you can maintain aggro without attacking, allowing you to block for longer periods of time. A tank character with guard effects, threat multipliers, and or improved shield bash can use these abilities to hold better aggro while blocking as well. Tanking the Lord of Blades is an exercise of three things. The first is maintaining aggro. 
Your job as a tank is to keep everyone else alive by occupying the biggest, baddest dude in the field of play. This allows characters that could not survive going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Lord of Blades to come into the raid, and that includes pretty much everybody but you, the tank. When the Lord of Blade jumps or hits the end of a phase, it is important that you re-establish control over him as quickly as possible. When he jumps, you can use a ranged weapon. Most of the tanks opt for a thrower, and in higher difficulties, this will need to be a thrower that can bypass his adamantine and good damage reduction. Much as possible, you should avoid establishing initial aggro by using Intimidate. There are a few reasons for this. First is that you don't want to attract attention from any trash or the dogs. The Lord of Blades is plenty to handle, you don't need anything else to help kill you. Two, you don't want to immediately put your Intimidate skill on timer. If you do need to use Intimidate to grab aggro, you may need to have folks wait until your timer is up. Third, he may be moving around and run out of your range. The rest of the party should either stay still or come to you to prevent this, but this does not always happen. This can be particularly true when the dog kiter grabs aggro, in which case you cannot intimidate. The second exercise is managing your hit points. This becomes increasingly important as more things start happening and the Lord of Blades starts using more special attacks. If you let your hit points get too low, then you become increasingly vulnerable to death, and if you are dead, you can't maintain aggro. As a general rule, I recommend that you try to maintain at least 500 hit points on normal, 600 on hard, 700 on elite, and 800 on epic elite. If you have more hit points than this, you can try to get some swings in and give yourself more of a threat buffer, like immediately after an Intimidate. An experienced tank knows that, especially on Elite, this is a crucial aspect to tanking Lord of Blades. Look for opportunities to block and have the party hold off for a few seconds to try and clear your Morland debuff. A brief pause is much more advantageous than getting another Morland stack and a dead tank. The third exercise is reacting to the Lord of Blades special attacks. Each of these attacks has not only a visible tell, but an auditory cue. As the tank, you will need to react quickly to the stun and whirlwind special attacks. As much as possible, you will want to block the stun attack. This takes practice, and the auditory cue, which sounds kind of like a sword being drawn with a rising pitch, happens before his visual cue. His left arm pulls back, but this is very similar to a normal attack. If you have a light monk, they can prevent you from being stunned with earth grasp, but you should still practice blocking. The Whirlwind attack is the most crucial special attack to react to. If you are able, immediately drop an Intimidate. This will ensure that you have aggro. Most wipes in this raid happen when aggro switches during a Whirlwind. As you are using Intimidate, move towards the Arcane Sludge and jump in for a dip. That's right, you are jumping into that Arcane Sludge that does a bunch of damage. But here's the thing, it does far less than the Whirlwind attack, and this is the difference between life and death for you and your party. This is also part of the reason you need to keep your hit points up. If you find yourself far from the sledge, you can get increased distance on Lord of Blades' knockback effect by jumping as he hits you. If you are chained, well, praying might be a good option. When the Lord of Blade jumps, pull out your thrower once you stop registering hits. You can actually start throwing before he lands once your targeting automatically re-establishes a lock if you don't manually change your targeting. If your hearing is particularly good, you can actually hear where he will land in relationship to you though even as an audio guy, I sometimes have trouble with this. Rain of Blades is fairly easy. If you are able, then it is a good idea to drop an Intimidate so he doesn't follow the party to the center. Then, just block. You are already going to be experiencing some extra damage here from the Blades. We want to minimize incoming damage from the Lord of Blades as much as possible. Alternatively, if you are a ninja spy too, you can run on the water to avoid this damage. But, if you aren't careful, the Lord of Blades may lose interest in you. You can also water strike during whirlwinds. Keep your head up, though. The Lord of Blades can and will whirlwind during the Warring of Blades. Let's continue the tanking lesson by talking about placement. We want to pull the Lord of Blades to the outer part of the circle. This will give everyone else more room to work in and will bring us closer to the sludge for whirlwinds. We also want to make sure that we are not in the hard north, south, east, or west. Set up in a spot where he won't land on you so you can bring him back to the same relative place after each jump without fear of getting squished. Lastly, set up on a tangent to the circle. That is to say, don't put the Lord of Blades and you in line with the center of the circle. This does a couple of things. The Lord of Blades will occasionally push you around, and the final move of his stun attack will also knock you back. When he does this, we don't want him to push you into the sledge. However, he can also chain you, seriously reducing your movement speed, and the ability to jump into the sledge. By setting up on a tangent, the Lord of Blades will bat you into the sledge with only 1-3 to three hits, though your healers will need to do some burst healing to compensate for the extra hits. 
call out if you are chained. I also find that setting up in this manner gives us better options for off-tank placement, and the experienced and brave clerics to get close enough to use their aura. The goal here is to create a good platform for off-tanks to attack Lord of Blades from behind without being knocked into the sludge, except when chained on a whirlwind. During the first phase, the tank may wish to block until the party is ready to engage the Lord of Blades. This will prevent you from getting more lands before the party is ready and increase the time you can attack. It is important to realize that your job as tank is not to kill the Lord of Blades, but rather keep yourself and the party alive so everyone else can kill him. In a similar fashion, once you get to the final phase, you should also look to block, once you've established aggro and parked the Lord of Blades. There's a lot more going on during both of these times, and you'll have less healing focused in your direction. In fact, let's talk about the final phase. During this time, the quarry mobs will start spawning. Someone should be cutting them around, but you may find as a tank that you will grab their aggro, particularly if you're using Intimidate, which you may want to avoid doing, particularly if you're not set up on the edge. Unless you have a Thor with Precise Shot, you may find that you have trouble hitting Lord of Blades with it through the trash. This may require you to run up to him and use your melee attacks to get his attention, and then return to your parking space. It is also important that you are consistent about where you are parking. Most of your party will be focusing outwards toward the pillars here. They won't be able to see Lord of Blades coming from behind. Generally, you will park on the opposite side of where the party will start with pillars, but as they work around in the circle, you can shift into an area that they have cleared of pillars. A final note here. The priority's primary tank may be the quarry kiter, so the tank during this phase may not be your best tank. The healers will also be needing to keep an eye on the kiter. Nevertheless, the tank may during this phase have the highest priority healing target. Most groups will split healing by assigning someone to heal the kiter. During this phase, it is extremely important for the healers to keep themselves and these two folks alive to protect the rest of the party so they can work on the pillars, even at the expense of those folks who should endeavor to be as self-sufficient and damage-free as possible. It's also a good idea to pause at the beginning of each phase. The Lord of Blades will briefly become unhittable during his dialogue. Once that ends, get in a few swings and start blocking. Wait until the dogs come over for a visit and run back to their chew toy. The second most common thing I see happen in the stalls in Epic Lord of the Blades raid is when the tank intimidates a dog. This usually causes the kiter a great deal of effort to reacquire them or demands the tank die to lose their aggro and that is the most common way to stall an epic Lord of Blades. Play this safe so you don't have to intimidate with dogs in the area. If your tank dies or acquires too many stacks of Morelands, you will need to have an alternate step in. On Elite, unless you brought a backup tank, this probably means you have someone grab aggro and block and you wait it out until your tank is ready to go again. Obviously, this means increased resources since this person is likely not ideal to tank and will require more healing, and you are getting no closer to your goal. As we have discussed, proper management of your hit points is crucial to a smooth run. On lower difficulties, you may be able to continue with a non-tank high hit point character holding aggro through simply attacking. They will not be able to do this as long since they won't be blocking, but if they can do so for about a minute 30, then your main tank will be able to step back in. You can also choose to tank via committee if your party does not have a tank build, though I don't recommend that you try this on difficulties higher than hard. This entails at least two folks alternating tank duties. It requires some extra coordination with healers in between the tanks, but can also be a good way to get newer tanks some time in the saddle, so they can build up some experience. In closing, don't be afraid to pause progress on the Lord of Blades to increase survivability, and always be ready for that poorly timed whirlwind. That will end this week's Epic Education. If you have any questions, comments, or corrections, you can email me at ddoepiceducation at gmail.com or visit my DDO blog at my.ddo.com backslash PJS Techie. Join me next time as I continue discussing The Lord of Blades. Thanks for listening. And thank you very much, Shamgar, for that excellent lesson. Uh, the Crunchy Bits keep on rolling with Epic Education. And uh, don't forget to check out PJS Techie on my DDO for his uh, weapon series and the all the actual textual notes from uh, Epic Education. Good stuff. Um, if you want to learn how to do the raids, he's got you covered. So uh, let's move on. We have another sponsor here, uh, kind of related to the uh, earlier one, but, uh, well, we'll play that for you. Attention consumers. Attention consumers. The maker of the Festivus Beholder Cookie are currently engaged in discussions to consider a settlement in a case which has impacted servers throughout Stormreach. If you consumed a Beholder Cookie during this year's Festivus and you or your loved one suffered injury or death, 
you may be entitled to a significant cash settlement. Call the law firm of Thornblade, Reknar, Warmunk, and Castivar, your partners in consumer affairs. The makers of the Festivus Beholder Cookie, Coin Lord Cookie Brands Incorporated, have been implicated in knowingly distributing a cookie, which can lead to forcible ejection from your seat. The consequences have been even more devastating. For a select few who failed to tie themselves down to prevent themselves from flying through the air, remember the law firm of Thornblade, Reknar, Warmunk, and Castivar is there to help you collect what is coming to you. So protect your rights. Give us a call now at 1-839-349-262266-2. Ah, yeah, so it's good to protect yourself. Uh, war monks make excellent lawyers, or so I hear. Uh, I once had a dwarven monk character. I always figured since they were lawful, they would make very good uh, lawyers. But uh, yeah, yeah, Maybe there's a dwarven monk thing, because I'm playing a dwarven monk today uh, as well. Now we're running around... Ataraxia's Haven, if you haven't noticed, doing our Dwarger working vacation. Yes. Uh, taking out the trash. Pretty much. Yeah. It's cleanup crew. I feel like a sanitation engineer on a tropical island. Yeah. Well, you get a good <laughs> suntan, you beat some guys up. It's good times. Uh, next up on the Hit Parade, uh, we have something odd that I recorded a while back. Uh, this has like some software developers' names from Turbine that may be no longer at Turbine. But, hey, <laughs> they're in my poem, and I ain't re-recording it, so that's all there is to it. So, uh, now for something completely different. As a special Festivus gift to you and yours, Stormreach Records on the Coin Lords present Gabrizar, the Infernal Bard, reading, "'Twas the Night Before Patch Day." "'Twas the night before Patch Day, and all through the house. "'Not a monster was stirring, not even a dire mouse. "'The traps were all set with sharp spikes and with fire, "'in hopes that adventurers soon would expire. "'The kobolds were nestled down snug in their beds, "'while visions of yark-yark treats danced in their heads. "'I was cleaning the mess that the Rusties had made. "'I've got to remember to get those things spade.' When I heard a strange noise from somewhere outside, so I picked up my crystal ball and I scried. I thought it might be those darn gold-farming spammers, but no, twas a pack of eight tiny programmers, pulling an airship all loaded with loot sacks. I knew in a moment it was St. Gygax. Resplendent in particle effects they came. Old Gary called out to each one by name. Now J-Dub, now Gazebo, the Rocking Dead. Go G-Cube, Eldorado, go Kodog, he said. Flying so fast, they must have been hasted. The elves and his crew looked totally wasted. From dark dungeon to tomb to sewer they flew. White-bearded Gary and developers, too. And then, in that moment, I heard a sharp sound, a crash and a clatter as the airship came down. I spun about, for I smelled something ripe. Out sprang St. Gygax from a waterworks pipe. His head was quite smooth, and his beard was bushy. His belly was round and looked rather cushy. I hid in a shadow, afraid that he'd see me. He stood resplendent in chainmail bikini. His voice was quite rough, not jolly or gay, like he had a habit of eight packs a day. "'Don't worry, my friend,' he called out in the gloom. "'I came here tonight to pimp out your tomb.' He put in more traps with poison and sonic, and dozens of oozes hopped up on chronic, some fall-away floors and unreachable chests. The hobgoblin archers got arrow-proof vests. He replaced all the shrines with elder beholders, and every coffin put skeletal soldiers. He made me immune to all kinds of magic. If heroes come here, it's bound to be tragic. With a wink and a nudge and a thumb up his nose, he picked up his sack and through the sewer he rose. I heard him call out as he sped through the night, Happy Batch Day to all! You'll be dead by first light! Ah, yes, and the difficulty, of course, of recording a show and trying to play DDO at the same time is not dying while you're doing a transition. See, look at that. Anne needs to come save me, because now I'm over here at the other computer. I'm helpless and defenseless, except for my necromantic aura. Just chugging away. Somebody shooting an arrow at me. I wonder if I'll survive. And I'm going to camp right here. You're going to go hide <laughs> oh, no. while I die? Oh, wait. You want me to save you? Like, yeah. 100% I think, save you. Yeah, you're going to have to finish these guys off before we can really continue the podcast. So <laughs> it's just one of the downsides. See, now he's got the stone skin on. It's really annoying. Ooh, but you got to crit with the Kopesh. That's good times. Yeah. Beat him up. Get him. 
There we go. That's better. There's still an arch. Oh, man, they're all the way over there. It's ridiculous. Yeah, let's All right, well, I'll tell you what. I'm just going to go move. <laughs> let's move and move and save our hides. I'm going to take this candy cane, and <laughs> which is a prize you can get when you turn in your coins. Did you know that? Yeah, the candy canes are pretty awesome, especially if you've got, like, your, your Warforged fighter or something like that, because they'll both do heal and repair equally, which is kind of a good deal. Um, the only thing is they're really slow to cast, as you can see. So if you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to save your life, uh, not so great. See, look at that. I've got full health. I was sitting there pounding on while I'm just sitting over here talking. It's because I healed you. Oh, did you heal me? I okay. thought, no, I could heal you. No, you, you can't heal me because I'm undead. Mom. You're undead. I'm healing myself. I'm a self-healing undead zombie machine of festival joy. Um, I love that character. And he's got his little red nose, uh, The uh, my uh, guy there. Sort of the Aww. best I can... Estimate as a as a festival companion. Okay, there we go. Back to the notes. Yeah, back to our notes. Uh, so what do we got next? Uh, you need to scroll up just a little bit there, darling, because uh, I can't see. Oops, Beginning sorry. of the community news. <laughs> back. So uh, let's do community news. Uh, Jaggy is hosting the annual Cookie Foundation contest on Thalanus. Uh, Jaggy is a Warforged bard on Thalanus. Uh, really kind of a great member of the community. And uh, this year, this year. Uh, you can win 10, 100,000 plat by guessing how many cookies and cakes are in Jaggy's inventory. Last year, she was sitting on 13,001 when the official count was done. Uh, now, many of them have been used since then, but many more are received, and Jaggy invites people to send her uh, cookies and jellies, and so it's very hard to guess, but she says, guess high. So uh, if you have an account on Thalanis and you want to win 100,000 plat, go and guess how many cookies she's going to have. Um, and uh, that's about it. You have to have a, an account on the Mighty Thalanis to win. Of course, you could just make a character there to get your 100,000 plat. That's a pretty good nest egg if you want to start out on another server. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? We got DDM's Realm. It's been updated with 200 plus new items. DDM's Realm, always kind of a nice uh, website. That's a lot of items. Yeah, lots of stuff there. They've got a pretty good items database. Uh, Turbine adds a uh, DDO community on G+. Uh, G+, communities are kind of cool because uh, they're more private. Maybe you can explain what the main difference is. Well, the main difference between G, between G plus regular and G plus pages or, or, or G plus pages is that D, DDO, or not DDO, but communities in G plus in general are a bit more contained. And they kind of run like th threads and they don't really um, kind of invade your other, your, your sort of your stream where where you want to keep an eye on specific things in this case if you really want m more focused information um, based on a group or a community then that's where you go cool yes yeah, so it's a good place to come and hang out ask for advice from other people people have been joining it pretty quickly uh, there's uh, a lot of folks on the DDO G plus community and uh, quite a few on the DDO cast uh, we started one up as well yep. so. mm -hmm. it's uh, called the DDO cast yarking grounds that's right. <laughs> so I guess the idea there was that, you know, we thought it would be a good place for people to chit-chat about stuff. So, um, yeah. And, of course, as usual, we put our DDO cast news there and all that kind of good thing. Yep. Uh, so, uh, are you ready for another segment and some more adventuring? Sure. Okay. Uh, next up, we've got Ludwig, Lud <laughs> Ludwig von Beethoven. Uh, if you know how that was spelled, you'd know how hard it is to say. <laughs> um, brings us another magical dragon fragment. Update 4, Sentinels. An adventure pack I still enjoy today, years after its release. But for a single, nagging, nagging, nagging. In the house beneath Enclave, a minotaur is torn from his fixation by the events of the Blood Tide incursion. If you are not familiar with Gorham, or his earlier concerns regarding the lion's head, suffice to say, he had a story. The devs took it away. But why get straight to the point, when we can take the roundabout way, in the magical capsule of ultimate redundancy and unnecessary conditionals? Through, <gasps> nope, not the gumdrop forest. Instead, let us journey into the heart of the project I am unlikely to ever finish. Russian Prince Productions presents Drag On Fragments from Eberron's Past. The Bones 
later determined to be the last intact mortal remains of the paladin Ludwig Beethoven, were discovered in the wee hours of a day destined for greyness. They were come upon near the entrance to the Phoenix by a lone member of the marketplace maintenance crew, whilst she was engaged in her weekly task of trimming the verge might obscure the grey stone. Poor girl! Most of the flesh, which, by the way, in the original orientation, as nature intended, had once defined the features of our most comely dwarf, was now found all raggedy wet, torn and scattered, in a straight but not so narrow path, up to and through the gates of the nearby sanatorium. He shouldn't a oughtn't to killed my kobolds. He shouldn't a oughtn't to. The partially consumed husk of a true druidic heart still smolders, all hot and sizzly, and, hey, I don't think I'm done here yet, amongst the bones. Poor girl. Poor Ludwig. A passer-by observes that it smells remarkably similar to Cargan's tasty ham. Mind you, not that preserved stuff adventures are always going on about, but rather what might be served at the rusty, hot from the hearth and smothered in the basty basty. His partner doesn't know ham, says it smells like monk. During the subsequent investigation, clean up and wash down, things are missed. Things like the cellophane pack, juggled by two air elementals looking for a third. A cellophane pack. Do-it-yourself TR, stamped sarcastically with the signet of the laughing knives. Pieces to the puzzle are strewn about. The players dance this way and that, peering at this, inspecting at that. Cracks in the crannies rest easy, for no one is risking their back. Through all this nonchalance, our eyes are drawn to something else, to the hedge she could not trim. For hidden there, down below the lowest branch, just there, near the roots, it lingers all in a knot. Fight or flight? Well, I'm a thief acrobat, light as a cat, and I hold the line taut to the very last thought of a man dying wrong. I lean in to coax it out. The lights on the stage are dim to black. We hold our breath. The veil of moon brings us back. And through the voice this thought I hold, cradled near from death's great cold, Gorham's story will now unfold. Gorham, he was Minotaur, lost his way. The story say Angry At a certain store Was that gore A minotaur Colors are there, but hard to touch. I don't remember all that much. Might have been the bandit, could have been the plate. There be those that tend to lean Fire God on Brigadine Well, I hold fast to my belief
Gorum pined for darkened leaf. Maybe they didn't take it away. Maybe it's a bug. If it's a bug, I should file a bug report. I'm going to find Gorham, record the coordinates, and file a bug report. How often does it happen? Like every time. It's so frustrating. It's got to be at least as important as some stupid box in a cobalt blockade, right? Good night, everybody. See you pod next time. So, how many podcasts can you listen to Minotaur Opera on? Yeah, one. One. That would be ours. <laughs> we have Minotaur Opera. Because there is only one Ludwig well, von it's Beethoven. Well, like a Minotaur ballad, really. I don't know. I would call that ap- opera uh, myself. I mean, really? but, uh, I yeah. Know. Yeah, story told through song. Um, ballad. Yeah, and the ongoing process of the project that may never be finished. That's true. Um, but uh, so long as we're here, we will bring it to you. <laughs> All right, other gaming news. What do we got? Um, Steam holiday sales. Uh, it has nothing to do with DDO particularly, although DDO is on Steam. But I love Steam, and they have ridiculous sales during the holidays. 75% off, all kinds of games, huge packages of stuff. I mean, Steam does this various times a year, but the holiday ones are perhaps the biggest ones. Also, according to Steam, I've been on there eight years, which is crazy. I didn't... I didn't remember it being around that long, but I guess so. It's been on there for quite some time. Yeah, ever since Half-Life, I believe. Right. So. It's, it started out buggy, but now it's improved. No, oh, I love that Vastly stuff. improved. Yeah. It's cool. You can buy gifts for people, uh, either if they're on Steam or even if they're not. You can mail it to them. Of course, they need Steam to get the gift. But anyway, uh, I buy stuff for a sweetheart here. Hi. She, you know, you can register. I want these games. And then if I have friends in faraway places that I'm thinking of, I can go see, hey, what kind of games have they got? Oh, are they on sale? Yes, I will buy them a copy. Yeehaw, that cost me three bucks. And now I have been nice. Um, sometimes a little bit more. But yeah, you can get all kinds of games for like $2.50. Why not? Good stuff. Um, the packages are great, too. Yeah. And you get all, like, 20 games yeah. from one maker. So. Every game Ubisoft made in the last <laughs> 20 years. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I picked up XCOM Enemy Unknown uh, just the other day. Played it just a tiny bit. Uh, really looking forward to it. It's pretty cool. Uh, that was on sale, though not super, super steep discount, but it was, like, you know, 20 30% off, something like that, which is great. It's a really good game. Yeah. I also got a gift from my brother, uh, Borderlands 2. <laughs> Even though he asked me not to, but I did it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, brother. Game of goodness. Which, uh, we were just watching uh, a video game program. I forget which one. But, uh, but... It's X-Play G- on G4. They were doing the Best Games Award for 2012. Yeah, and they gave it to Borderlands 2, the best game of the year. Yep, which, best um, game of the year on X-Play. It's pretty damn fun. Uh, it's really good. Not the same kind of game as DDO at all, but uh, very cool. Great for shooting people. Yes. Speaking of shooting people, no, wait, um, <laughs> that has no segue continuity whatsoever. Uh, more like, uh, speaking of artistic endeavors having to do with holidays in some fashion, uh, our next little segment here is a blast from the past, uh, and uh, if, uh, did, did we keep the part where he gives his uh, phone number and everything? No. No, no okay. <laughs> no, we, t- right. we took out his personal number. All right, well, if that part was in there, <laughs> don't send him emails, because he doesn't do stuff for the show so much anymore, but, of course, you could still send Skaggy something and say, hey, he's awesome, we remember you from DDOcast. And enjoy your stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, just email us at ddocast.com, at ddo, ddocast at gmail.com, and then um, we'll forward that on to him. Yeah, and every once in a while he does another piece for us. So uh, yeah. anyway, here's Skaggy the Poet uh, with a little holiday ch- Hello and welcome to Christmas DDO Poetry Corner with your festive host, Skaggy. Christmas poems about or inspired by DDO. Okay, or just ripped off from other Christmas poems. Merry Christmas! On the twelfth day of festival, the jester sent 
to me. Twelve rage quitters, eleven zergers, zerging, ten permadeathers, perishing, nine instances of lag, eight parties wiping, seven delayed, druid, six pieces of fender trash, five crunchy bits, four festival tokens, three random pug invites, two leftover pairs of vampire teeth, and a one in a million chance of finding a bloodstone. And uh, I don't know if you noticed on the previous break, but uh, my mighty, all-powerful, necro-wizard monk guy got his ass handed to him. And uh, I died. Yes, you did. Because Anne was lagging. <laughs> I'm sure that's my reason. Actually, I ran out of spell points, which is really bad for Mr. <laughs> Little Wizard. Uh, while he's pretty cool and he's got all these neat buffs and stuff, they don't last very long. And so when you're hopping back and forth, uh, you tend to use up all your spell points. And then you find yourself without any ability to heal yourself, unless you come out of zombie mode, in which case you lose a bunch of hit points, and then they, uh, your damage reduction goes away, and they tear you into little tiny shreds while you're trying to drink a little cure light potion. It doesn't work so good. Uh, yeah, that's how it goes. So you die instantly afterwards. Yes, indeed. And on that note of dying instantly in the holiday spirit, we come to the end of today's DDOcast holiday special, such as it is. <laughs> We've had a joyous good time. I hope you have, too. That and was quick and dirty, really. <laughs> yeah, I guess Most so. of it recorded, but, you know, we enjoyed it. We hope you do, too. We like it easy. All right. <laughs> Big thanks to producer Ann for this strange little live format. It's been kind of fun, actually. I like doing this. It's, this is a weird recorded format, mainly because, well, we didn't want to do a live show. We were, it's the holidays, and we want to do this on our own convenience. Ann is baking cookies. I was watching football with a friend. I don't normally watch football, but I do like my friends very much. So mm. we watch football, and uh, the football team around here, the Seattle Seahawks, actually won that itself. Something of a holiday miracle. They usually don't. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, according to my friend, they're very good this year. I hear that a lot, and then they die horribly. But Seahawks Christmas wish? I never really had witnessed them actually <laughs> kicking a lot of butt, which they did tonight. So Anyway, that was still kind of fun. So uh, I hope you guys all have a wonderful, happy holiday, that you get much loot in your loot sacks, and you have a great time, and uh, you get some gaming in, and you get some cool presents, and you have fun with your family, and eat some food and all that stuff. Uh, also, to all those folks uh, out at Turbine, thanks for the great game. Uh, good job squashing the bugs. Keep up the hard work. Don't let any more of those little nasty things into our game, please. Thank you very much. That would be nice. Yeah. And uh, big thanks to all the fine listeners and uh, so on and so forth. So if you want to be a part of the show, you can leave us a voicemail on the Yark line at one eight five five ddo yark That's one eight five five three three six nine two seven five. Or you can email us, as always, at ddocast at gmail.com. Give us something to say on the air or make a request. Join in the show as a guest or make us a segment or a commercial or one of these things in you could be on the next holiday special. Yay, uh, yeah. Poetry, anything musical, role-playing segment, anything. Nah, just nothing terribly dirty or um, obscene or that yeah. makes us want to plug our ears while you hear nasty <laughs> feedback or, uh, you know, your greatest collection of throat noises, something like that, and we don't want that. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> we, might, we might get a good amusement out of it. We won't put it on the show. All right, uh, we leave the unprofessionalism to the professionals. <laughs> And that's it. We're going to go out with just a little bit more of the Trans-Siberian Orchestra doing something classy and tasteful. Mm -hmm.